Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ken Fisher, founder, executive chairman, and co-chief of investment officer of Fisher Investments. A 200 plus billion global money management firm serving large institutions and high net worth individuals throughout most of the developed world. Mr. Fisher wrote the Forbes Portfolio Strategy column for 32 plus years in 2017, making him the longest continuously running columnist in Forbes history. He now writes weekly columns for USA Today and Germany's Focus Money and monthly columns in the United Kingdom's Financial Times, Denmark's Borsen, and Netherlands Telegraph and Spain's El Economista. Mr. Fisher authored 11 books, including four New York Times bestsellers and has been published, interviewed, and written about in publications globally. Ken, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. The floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, and thank you to uh, everyone that's uh, tuned in. I appreciate it. Uh, they told me that I have four hours to speak to you. Uh, no, no, that, that that's wrong. They they told me that when I talk, it feels to you like I've been talking for four hours. Uh, so I've got some visuals. I'm going to try to clip through things pretty quickly. Uh, and I'd like to start uh, by just trying to go through a couple of really basic concepts about how markets work that I think are usually not accepted or fully fathomed by people. And I hope that will help you. Uh, mostly people are, tend to be too um, wrapped up in themselves when they think about markets and tend to be too, if you will, humanistic. And uh, thinking about things that seem logical, but miss the concept of how markets work. Uh, a really common one uh, that you hear recently, for example, I think this next visual just more or less annihilates, but you can annihilate it 17 ways from Sunday, which is, uh, uh, you know, for some reason, the visuals aren't working for me. That's annoying. <laughs> Ken? Yeah. And I know down at the lower left hand corner of your PowerPoint, there should be um, some arrows that kind of that show up or you can move them forward or well, back. I think I'm going to need to stop the screen share and start, start it over again. Okay, go ahead. Let's Let do that real quick. That. Not a problem. Let me try that again. Let me go to the slideshow from the beginning. Now let's try that. There we go. So uh, if you look at this, this is just a simple visual that annihilates the concept that shifts in uh, uh, long-term interest rates impact stocks. Uh, you know, from 1926 to present, you get this huge, uh, almost perfect uh, array of rates falling for 20 years, then rising steeply for almost 40, then falling fairly steadily for 40. And meanwhile, stocks just kind of keep going up at an irregular rate with a little bit of volatility around it. If you wanna use views about interest rates to help you figure out the stock market, you're gonna be out of luck. And one of the reasons is because rates, long rates are part of capital markets and they move off all the same information that stocks move off of. Uh, they're both pre-pricing the future similarly, uh, slightly differently, but only slightly differently. So the trying to use one to forecast the other is uh, trying to use something that's pre-priced against something else that's pre-priced and it doesn't work, it's ridiculous because markets are in the pre-pricing business. And once you get that pre-pricing part uh, and understand it better, it really helps you understand better what works and what doesn't. And another one that's really common, you can hear this a lot right now, is people saying, oh my gosh, there's all the stuff that's going on in politics that's going to relate to these big bills that people talk about. And that's going to do this, which is going to cause that, which is going to do this to stocks or bonds or da 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 da, -da. And, and again, this misses the concept of pre-pricing because you cannot get material legislation through uh, Congress or any other major foreign country's uh, government without one heck of a lot of public scrutiny beforehand which of course involves pre-pricing. So here, for example, is just a simple visual of returns after the first central bank rate hike in America uh, and the world stock market in the previous 12 months, following 12 months, following 12 months after that, and then 12 months after that. And you actually see there's no consistent pattern. Mostly stocks are up about the same amount 
or more than they normally are. Why? Because the fear of it tends to happen before the legislation ever occurs. And then once the legislation occurs, it's all been pre-priced. Uh, this is a part that people miss because they always think they can think it through better than markets can. And markets are pretty darn good at pre-pricing this stuff. Perfect? No. Better than you and me? Yes. And, and that's really hard because we all tend to want to think I'm smarter than the other guys. If I'm smarter than the other guy, I can figure it out better. Da, 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 da. That is just a drain that takes you down to the sewer. Uh, Sir John Templeton had this legendary line that I've always loved. He was a marvelous human being. I was lucky to be able to meet him a little bit um, when I was younger, uh, it, you know, which is that bull markets were born on pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. And measuring that is actually a pretty good way to tell you the degree to which you're likely to be in trouble when you look out into the period that markets be priced. But one of the problems that people tend to have is they tend to have difficulty figuring out time periods at markets pre-price. So simply said, if you take a panic like we had with the pandemic, and we do get panics where big bad things come out at some place that no one was thinking about, no one was talking about, and they're not pre-priced. When that happens, stocks pre-price down into the short end of the range that they pre-price in. Normally, stocks pre-price and look at things that are approximately three to 30 months ahead. And they bounce around in that time frame in terms of what they're pre-pricing, but it's three to 30 months. So when we look at this, what we tend to see is panics move you to the short end. And then after that, they tend to want to move to the long end. And then after that, they bounce around in between. So if you were to take today and you were to say, What's the market pre-pricing? My answer is, well, I don't really know the time frame exactly, but it's someplace in the next three to 30 months. Uh, legendarily, as I think all of you know, stocks go down before a recession and stocks go up before a recession ends and the economy starts rising again. Stocks are pre-pricers. They're a leading indicator. They move in advance of things because they're always looking forward, approximately three to 30 months. So remembering that helps you actually think through what is it that I should be worrying about now? And it's not what's in the news today. If it's broadly in the news today, it's been priced. Uh, will there be little wiggles? Of course, there's always little wiggles in the stock market. But the direction of the stock market is determined in that pre-pricing three to 30 month mode. The most important thing to remember this year has been, which is actually the most important thing to remember last year, that the 2020 bear market while it had the magnitude of a bear market, in most other respects, acted like a hugely oversized stock market correction, not a bear market. If you think through bear markets, they normally last a good period of time, averaging more than a year in length. Uh, they tend to move relatively steadily. The Beginnings of them, we'll talk about this later, but the beginnings of them tend to be more mild in the back of them, the end of them. Corrections tend to be short, sharp, come out of no place, have an almost V-like pattern, uh, like that blue line that you see. On average, they're down about 15% instead of being down more than 20%. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the average, the average bear market's down more than 30%. And the 2020 bear market had that magnitude, but it had almost perfectly the duration of a correction. And in fact, I believe, and I've always said, and I've written about this extensively over this time period on a regular basis, that we did not have a recession in 2020. We had a different thing, a contraction. A recession is the normal function of the aftermath of a business cycle that's gotten carried away as excess is built into it. And the capitalistic system has to rectify somehow some way and correct those before you can move on to the next expansion. But in fact, what we had was a governmental shutdown in America and the rest of the developed world that contracted the economy. It, didn't, it wasn't caused by prior excesses. It was caused by the governmental reaction to the pandemic and the shutdowns, which shut down business. And then when those were released, business started bouncing back with a little bit of time delay, but the market pre-priced a contraction almost perfectly in that function. And when you think about that, it's a 
hugely oversized correction in the way it acts, then everything else that's happened subsequent to that actually falls into the pattern of what normally happens after a correction, not what normally happens after a bear market. After a bear market, normally the things that have been beaten down the most, the lower quality, smaller value stocks that would die if the economy ended up being as bad in the recession as people feared it might, they bounce back the most, uh, starting with a kind of an overreaction to what uh, ends up first feeling like a dead cat bounce. But in fact, um, when you think through uh, this one, it was short and sharp. And normally, the late stages of a cycle have these big upward moves, which we've had. The economy has been healthy, but it's been missing expectations because we're already back to pre-contraction or what you might think of as pre-recession, but I think of as pre-contraction level. And so there's no need for a big boom like you normally have early in an economic expansion after a recession. And in that environment where growth is slowing, what normally does best? You don't need to be a genius to figure this one out. What normally does best is growth stocks, not value stocks, because growth stocks do well in an environment where the economy isn't growing buoyantly, just growing slowly. Uh, in fact, GDP recovery is beyond well underway and should keep going, but at a moderate rate. And normally in a late cycle, and I consider this late cycle, not early cycle, we had a technical bear market because of the magnitude, but the duration was not. What does better are the big growth and big growth today is dominated overwhelmingly on a cap weighted basis by big tech. Normally the beginning of an economics uh, bull market is led by that small value stuff bouncing back. In the middle, it bounces all around between growth and value and you can't really tell style leadership based on size or growth or value characteristics. But the late stage of a cycle is normally led by growth, the early stage is normally led by value. Getting that in your head and that the market's pre-pricing the next three to 30 months in those aspects uh, helps you uh, understand where you should be, where you shouldn't be. From the beginning of this bull market, pundits have been saying overwhelmingly, you need to own value, you need to own value, you need to own value. And in 2020, growth pummeled value. Uh, of course, just to be clear, growth tends to be, you know, what just uh, waste a couple of moments of your time. You, you, you people all pay a lot of attention to this stuff, so I presume you know it. But growth stocks tend to be ones that have fatter growth operating profit margins, sales minus cost of goods sold, and they spend a lot of that money on growth-oriented initiatives, the, uh, the operating profit on growth-oriented initiatives. They tend to be perceived as having higher quality management. They tend to be perceived as uh, having innovative features. Uh, value stocks usually are more low valuation, uh, pay higher dividend yield uh, often. They tend to be more cyclical and economically sensitive, uh, and they tend to be found more in what you could view as saturated or fairly commoditized industries, uh, materials, energy, uh, consumer staples uh, often, uh, and, and consumer durables like uh, autos. Um, when you think of this again, if you just think of the percentage of a bull market in duration, that the large growthy tech kind of stuff tends to underperform early on and tends to outperform toward the end as, as uh, you get to this part where the economy is slowing, slowing, slowing. And th this, is an, this visual is another visual of basically what I showed you before. I'm not going to waste a lot of time on it, but I, I, I make this point. It's not always true that in the lat latter stages, big growth is leading. Sometimes small growth is leading. But you want to be very, very careful because what happens and going back to how markets work, is that when you get to a bear market, when that happens, if you haven't seen it correctly, which is very difficult to do, we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's very difficult to do. And if, if, if you get to a bear market and you're in smaller stocks, liquidity tends to dry up like crazy. In the bigger growth stocks, it doesn't. So you've got a potential amount of liquidity to let you get out without getting pummeled. In small growth, you can actually see these price gaps where you get pummeled on the way down. And uh, that, that can be very punishing. So my advice, even when, if small growth were to do better than big growth is the extra liquidity late in the bull market is worth. 
and, and this, of course, is 2021, and, and to date, growth has done better than value. You had a period in, early in the year uh, tied to enthusiasm about the vaccines and uh, clarity, getting clarity in politics. It was the other way around. Um, but overall, from the beginning of this bull market that started in uh, the end of March of 2020, last year, uh, it's been a period that's been uh, led overwhelmingly last year, and then overall now, this year, by the large growth stock, which again is dominated by large tech. Uh, normally, that is the case when the yield curve spread is low because value companies tend to be needing bank financing and banks are in the business of taking in short-term deposits to uh, finance long-term loans. And they tend to, when the yield curve spread is low, be less eager to lend and therefore less eager to lend to lower quality firms and they cut off a lot of the value stocks. The reality is the growth stocks have multiple financing options and having multiple financing options aren't impacted by that. So normally this is one of the key factors that favors growth at a point in time when the yield curve spread widens markedly um, quite a lot, that tends to move you back toward a uh, value again, which is normally what happens at that period when you've ended a normal bear market in recession, leading to the value stocks bouncing back heavily early on in the new bull market. I want to point out that QE, and I've written about this extensively if you want to read my writings, QE has never, ever been stimulated anywhere that it's been deployed. They always say it's stimulus. It never has been. It never is. It never will be. It flattens the yield curve, and because it flattens the yield curve and reduces banks' propensity to lend, it's anti-stimulus. And in fact, that's why the expansion from 2009 uh, through uh, 2020 was the slowest economic expansion in U.S. history because quantitative easing flattened the yield curve, reduced bank propensity to lend. If you remember when you took uh, economics, uh, the quantity of money is increased in a fraction of reserve banking system, any fraction of reserve banking system, by process of the banking system increasing its net outstanding loans. And when banks aren't eager to do that, it is exactly the reverse of stimulative. It's why we had a low inflation, uh, low growth expansion, in, in the period from 2009 to 2020. And, and seeing that, understanding that uh, was central to that period, but it remains true if you think about it correctly. Uh, the economy also is not stimulated ever by so-called stimulus. Here's all the stimulus acts that have ever been done since 1970, uh, their size and uh, GDP growth rate afterwards. And you actually find that the median growth rate slows down after the stimulus program. Uh, if, if you think about stimulus, the way it's done, it, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive and, and, and antithetical to the way humans want to think. They think the government takes this money, it spends it all this stuff that should stimulate the economy. But the fact of the matter is there is no money to take. It's out of one pocket into another pocket. And the people that it's taken from uh, already had a use for it somewhere. And the banking system uh, or the financial system as a whole, including shadow banking, uh, has always uh, engaged in disintermediation that provides the money from someone who has no intent for it other than to put it in a bank, put it out someplace into a system where it gets lent for uh, functional purposes. That, that gets diverted by stimulus and, and, and stimulus has never been similar. It's not terribly anti-stimulative, but it's not stimulative. Uh, so, you know, the stimulus programs say, boy, oh boy, we're gonna get all this overheating from the stuff that the government wants to do ahead. Mm, not so much. Milton Friedman, a legendary guy, really marvelous man, I uh, used to always say inflation is caused by too much money chasing too few goods, and that's a hard thing to argue against. But what you can argue against that Friedman would have said is that you can measure money in the ways that the central banks do. Uh, that used to be true, I believe. I believe it's no longer true. Uh, I believe that money is what people use to engage in transactions. And instead, in fact, what we found is that um, we have so many different ways to do that, that the traditional ways of using money are often not used in preference for others. Uh, you know, when was, how often do you use your checking account? How often do you use your savings account? How much cash do you use in green bills? Uh, so you can see here, this which has confused so many people, which is the growth rate in so-called M2 and the velocity of M2. Uh, Friedman and traditional monetarists would have always said money, supply, money velocity is unpredictable and a largely steady state. But you know, since 1995 on, the velocity of money as we've had multiple alternate forms of money has uh, steadily shrunk. And as it, the M2 exploded tied to what was done last year, 
uh, the velocity just imploded to offset it, which is why inflation hasn't exploded. I mean, we have a big pickup in inflation, but you can see this also in US and global loan growth being very subdued. Again, the way you really increase the quantity of money is to increase loan growth in the, across the banking system, globally uh, and in America. Any place you have a fractional reserve banking system. And that really hasn't happened. Since that really hasn't happened, there isn't as much actual inflation pressure as people think. And all the noise you hear about inflation today, I want you to remember the most important thing about that. It's very widely discussed. So therefore, free price. Here's uh, core inflation, headline inflation. And you know you can see the headline inflation's up, the core inflation's flattening. And partly that's because we've had all these bottlenecks. People have gotten used to reacting to the bottlenecks. These things will get overcome. They're being overcome. And you can see that in different categories where pricing started to collapse earlier, like in lumber, the prices went so high in, in the spring, but have come back down uh, to levels that were um, pre-panic. Um, uh, and, and in fact, one of the ones that you hear a lot about today is energy. Here's uh, EU natural gas prices, which have been off hugely since uh, their peak early last month. This is just starting to turn around. There, I'm not gonna waste my time on it. I've written a fair amount about this. Uh, you can look up my writings, but uh, the, the energy price uh, increase is going to unravel. It's just gonna take another year to get it fully done, but it started already, in, particularly in the last month. Um, I want to talk about politics very briefly. Both parties are good for stocks. Uh, they're just slightly different. Uh, Congress, of course, you know, it's got a very, very tight margin. Uh, the, the reason in the title of my talk about get past this lap, the next lap's easier. Uh, we've had the inaugural year. Uh, here's the uh, S&P 500 arrayed by first, second, third, and fourth year's president's terms. We're, we're in the second year. Uh, we're, in, actually, we're in the inaugural year. The year ahead is... Uh, second year, midterm year. Right? If you look at the red, uh, first, if, if you don't see the red on your screen, don't drive a motor vehicle. But uh, if you look at the red, it's all in the first two years, pretty much. There's very little in the back. Uh, almost all big legislation in America happens in the first and second years. All the consternation about it happens in the first and second years. The midterms tend to give you relative gridlock or absolute gridlock, which tends to put an end to that game. If you can get past next year, without a negative year. Uh, I mean, we've obviously in all your years been a good year for stuff. If you can get past next year without it being a terrible year, uh, the third and fourth years get pretty darn easy. That's, that's the title I'm gonna talk about. If you, can, if you can hold your breath through the next lap, a lap after that gets easier. We haven't had a negative third year for president's term since 1939, and it was only down nine tenths of 1%. Third years move you from this part where people get all upset about what the administration might do to a point where all the administration ever does is twiddles its thumb and kiss babies. And uh, the reality is it's pretty much that way in the fourth year. Not perfectly so. Uh, I, I'd like to move pretty quick here uh, so, so that I could take a question or two. But if you actually look at the array of first, second, and third years, the second year tends to be pretty darn flat early on, on average. This is weekly returns in uh, the S&P and uh, then pick up uh, toward the end of the year, which is pre-pricing now, which is ahead, which is the effects of gridlock uh, after the election. And, and we're gonna get that in uh, 2022. And, and so that average year may well be a lot what uh, 2022 looks like. And that's kind of what I want you to see is that that archetypal second year tends to be on average kind of flattish. Uh, if it's negative, it'll be negative in the first part of the year. You gotta keep an eye out for that. Uh, again, I want to remind you, tax hikes really don't have the impact, whether it's corporate personal capital gains that people think they do because they're pre-priced, and that's what we're doing right now. Uh, likewise, even when you move these ones all together, same thing. It's, it's an amazing feature that's, yeah, again, that's not the way humans want to think. Oh, taxes are going to go up, stocks have to go down. No, we have a long history of tax movements up and down, and we have a long history of stock movements. You can do correlation coefficients, and there's no there there. Whenever you see somebody say X causes Y, and we have a lot of X's in history and a lot of Y's in history, you know, look, look take your computer, look up a, a software that gives you the ability to do correlation coefficients and see if there's a correlation there. If there's not a correlation, then there's no causality there. Um, a couple of bear market rules, and then I'm going to take a question. Too. Um, 
basically the very beginning of bear markets, conventional bear markets tends to be general. It's the back part that gets you. The back one third of the time tends to be two thirds of the magnitude drop. The first three months tend to be pretty gentle. So I've always had a rule and, and I've done some, I've called some bear markets successful and some not. Pretty tough thing to do. Pretty tough thing to do is just don't try to call a peak in advance. Wait until you've seen higher prices earlier. Look back and see, can you see something big and bad that isn't already widely priced? It's that back part. Bear markets typically on average run 2% a month, but the real steep part tends to be the back part. It's that part of the last few months and it kills you. You can get out of a bear market early on without getting crunched. You wanna hang on through the bull because the last part of the bull tends to be big, see higher prices earlier, which might be next year. And uh, look and see if big problems ahead or not. The big problems that aren't pre-priced, wanna tie to best as possible sidestep and avoid that steep part of the bear market. But if you can get past 2022 without a problem, 2023 gets a lot easier in equities. With that, if there's a question, I can, got a couple of minutes, I guess I can take a question or two. Do we have any questions? I can, yes, we do. Um, James is asking, uh, common wisdom is that rising interest rates impact growth stocks the most because of the discounting effect. Do you agree with that? That's ridiculous. It's actually historically inaccurate and it makes the stupid assumption, I mean, just simply stupid, that a one capital market isn't pre is pre-priced off of something different than another capital market. But let me make uh, a, a more important point in one way. The fact is, no one single factor ever controls style leadership. Does that make sense to you? There's myriad things going on and interest rates are just one of them. But interest rates, of course, are capital markets and capital markets, the interest rate market is being pre-priced off all the same information stocks are. So that concept is one that's just kind of, uh, it, it's a nice concept. I understand that you know rates are affected this kind of present value of stocks. In theory, it's not easy to see why that should impact tech with growth projections into the future more. But in fact, there's no history to support that. And number two, uh, there's all these other factors. Thank you, Ken. Uh, now, the what is your outlook for gold and Bitcoin? <laughs> That's great. Uh, so uh, on gold, when I was young, I forecast gold wrong so many times that I made a, a people always ask me this, I always tell them the same thing, it's always been true. I, I made a solemn vow when I was young, uh, to never have a forecast about gold again ever in the rest of my life in the name of uh, good luck. And I've adhered to that ever since and I've had good luck. So um, not perfect luck, but good luck. And, and so, you know, I, I don't really have a view. Gold is very, very hard to time. It gets most of its return overwhelmingly off of a tiny percentage of its total time. Most of history, it's actually lost money. It's made money overall, but most of history has lost money. If you can, it, I mean, it, it gets its return out of 15% of the time. Whereas, for example, stocks are positive, you know, a little over two thirds. Bonds are positive more often than that. Uh, if you can time gold, you don't need any advice from me about anything. And I, I certainly don't know how to do it. Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin's way over my head, way beyond my pay grade. All right. Now, the Elliott Wave predicts 50% correction. Do you have any thoughts on that? No. I, I haven't paid attention to Elliott Wave in my lifetime. Okay. I mean, uh, literally, I, I don't want to get, get get into it, but uh, I concluded that that was a wrong way to view capital markets when I was very, very young, and I've never seen any evidence to contradict it. Linda would like to know where you see the price of oil going in this in six months, a year to three years. Energy prices generally on a global basis are headed lower. Uh, we had all these uh, constriction associated bottlenecks. Uh, they're impacted in lots of different ways. I mean, ironically, Europe, which is a major part of the global economy, uh, has shifted heavily in recent decades to wind. And then this year, just at the time when other things were happening, the wind stopped in Europe. Uh, but the winds are starting to pick up again. They have been picking up good return back to normal. Uh, uh, but then also you had the problems with coal in China. You had uh, Nord 2 pipeline issues. You had uh, the hurricane in America. Da, 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 da. All those things are reverting back. 
Oil takes a little bit longer to pull your capacity back up than let's say that chart that I showed you earlier of lumber where it's easier to restart a lumber mill than it is to uh, you know, restart what you have in energy, but the energy will come around and prices six, 12 months will be irregularly headed lower. Thank you, Ken. Now, Julie would like to know what your biggest concern in relation to the market going forward over the next few months in the short term and of course the long-term view. That's a great question. So you know what, what we're doing right now as we have all these bottlenecks is we're in capitalism, doing this and doing that and doing the other to try to keep our own individual businesses going as well as possible. And it's logical why that would be the case, but in that regard, we're building in those kinds of extraordinary excesses that are non-normal that will have to be rectified at some point. And that is what is likely to lead to a recession to the extent that we have. The attempts to overcome that which we're doing to zig and zag away from the zigs and zags that we've created uh, as formalities associated, structural formalities, governmental formalities, cultural formalities associated with uh, trying to recover from the pandemic. All right, Ken, well, we are at time. We sure appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it uh, one and all.